Thank you very much, members. So before I begin my speech, it forced me to yield the chair to the President-elect and ex-secretary at Magdalen College. He's been waiting for me to yield it to him for quite a while now. Anyway, good evening, members. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's lively debate so far. So it's fallen on myself and the rest of the illustrious proposition to convince you that the history of the world is not merely the biography of great men, but rather a long and winding path where many factors, social, economic, intellectual, have shaped the course of history. The burden of proof, then, has fallen on the opposition who ensure that history is solely the story of the actions of great men and women, or as they've been more recently termed, big beasts. This is particularly the case when one considers what Thomas Carlyle, the founder of the great man theory, actually wrote, which Sir Richard kindly quoted, namely that all things that we see standing accomplished in this world are properly the outer material result, the practical realization and embodiment of thoughts that dwelt in the great man sent into the world. This is a highly uncompromising theory. I shall not mention the inherent sexism or the fact that the theory written in the 1840s is clearly a product of its time. Rather, I shall leave the above quote to speak for itself, and I instead have four arguments to put to you tonight. But first, ladies and gentlemen, and I couldn't resist doing this, I have to engage in some rebuttal of what the opposition has said. So just briefly to go back to the director of research's speech. He said we must learn from great men. In response to this, I ask, how can we learn from those who we idolize if we cannot understand the circumstances in which they became great? For Mr. Ginson, he talked about Disraeli's great ideas, his role as a great man in history, but do we not see Disraeli also, when we look closely, as a man placed on a pedestal by a failing conservative party and the Primrose League? Do we not look at him as a man propped up by Sandon, Slater Booth, the Earl of Derby, people who you may not have heard of? Yes. I have named several men. The definition given by Carlyle, which I'll go on to later, would firmly cement these people as very far from great men in the sense of the theory. Briefly, regarding what the CCC said, I'm afraid that his argument is almost entirely nullified if we take the motion as regret, not reject. But anyway, that's a matter of semantics, not of the motion. No, thank you. So, moving on to my four arguments, ladies and gentlemen. I will keep them fairly brief. My first is that under no definition of history can it even be remotely viewed as the work of great men entirely. Second, that competing theories of history struggle to adequately explain what actually shapes the passage of events, but that Marx and Hegel, for example, are more reliable guides to history than Carlyle. Third, that the notion that history is shaped by great men crumbles when one truly considers acts of God and broader economic trends. Finally, the idea of great men, who I do consist exist in the sense that they are somewhat, though not entirely influential, is predicated on this harmful idea of natural, perhaps genetic, superiority, which fails to understand the role of circumstance and luck. Before I commence my case, however, I must first thank the President for giving me the opportunity to speak in this debate. Members, you may be surprised to hear that he initially asked me to speak on side opposition, defending the great man theory. The organizational prowess of the Union knows no bounds. I do suppose, however, that he later realized you might get bored hearing me talk about myself for 10 minutes. Either way, I can comfortably say that I do stand before you today defending a point of view that I believe in, that for myriad reasons, history cannot simply have been shaped by great men. As a brief caveat before I begin my argument proper, I must state that as a classic student, I'm keen to delve into histories and circumstances from the more distant past, from a time when history was less self-conscious, before notions such as the great man theory or the spirit of history or historical materialism even existed, when historia equally meant a sort of story as a history in a more modern sense. So with Sallust and Thucydides as my guides and looking at the great men of Rome and Athens, let me commence my argument that history is never really about leaders, priests or prophets, but rather about the people by whom great men are produced and supported, but without whose activities, sentiments and work, they would not exist. So the first argument in proposition of this motion, which I will make, is one of definitions. To take the last word first, history could mean one of two things. Either history is everything which precedes the present, which the um, honorable speakers on both sides have used tonight, or history is a written record of what has happened, as in Herodotus' histories. If we do work with the second definition, if one takes history meaning a record of what has happened, it need only be said there exist many excellent social histories. Brunt's Fall of the Roman Republic springs to mind, which are both popular and give logical explanations for historical events. 
But to turn to the more likely explanation, that history is everything that has happened in the past, the real stumbling block for those in favor of the great man theory becomes the question of where one draws the line between a great man and a good man, or an average man. The definition of great man given by Carlyle was incredibly exclusive. He presented detailed analysis of six types of hero, the divine, Odin, the prophet, Muhammad, the poet, Shakespeare, the priest, Martin Luther, the man of letters, Rousseau, and the king, Napoleon. These are all his examples at the very, very pinnacle of their fields. Sadly, though the king could perhaps be used to refer to a cabinet minister, they would not refer, sadly, yet, to the president of New College. But I'm not even sure that Carlyle would be happy to say that a politician or an archbishop was a great man. The people listed above were all, as I've said, the very pinnacle of their fields. With such a specific definition, the suggestion that history is the product of the actions of great men comes to mean something more like history is the product of only the very greatest of men, those who have made decisive actions to shape the course of history. They're not someone who has preserved history, they are someone who has changed it. They've founded a religion or a nation. They have created a philosophical school, they've come up with a scientific idea. In other words, members, they are once in a generation. There are fewer of them throughout history than there are of us in this chamber right now. But with this definition, one then asks, what are those figures like Tiberius, like Cicero, Lord Liverpool, Nikita Khrushchev, who presided over or preserved systems that already existed, but in doing so for many years left their own passage on them, their own mark on the passage of time? What are those who had less impact, who will go on, still go on in history books? What then are the ordinary person who carries out their life in relative anonymity? Does one really have to be a Caesar, a Henry VIII, or dare I say a Hitler, to have any influence on history? My point, members, is that the great man theory is either too exclusive and thus limited in its scope, or, if it were to have any actual relevance, would be so broad as to concede acres of intellectual mileage to the view that history is the aggregate of the actions of all human beings. To begin my second argument, that other theories are more adequate than Carlyle's, let us consider Marx's idea of historical materialism. To summarize, Marx believed that social progress and ultimately history is driven by the material and human resources which society has at its disposal and that relations between humans partaking in the production of goods from these resources defines the structure of society. This theory makes more sense than Carlyle's, yes. Does the speaker believe the Marxist construction of history to be suitable in explaining, say, the medieval period or anything pre-industrial revolution? Well, as um, hopefully will become apparent in my argument about early Rome, which preceded the medieval period, um, yes, I do believe that the Marxist explanation is actually fairly relevant to ancient and by extension, I'm not an expert in medieval history, thank you. Um, to carry on with another theory of history, um, which is Hegel's, the spirit of history is actually fairly compelling, bar all the sort of wishy-washy um, sort of God, God stuff. Um, so he argues that the key um, to human agency is their self-consciousness. We locate ourselves in a social space and further in a historical space, and the social circumstances in which we exist define the course of our lives when combined with our self-consciousness. Shaped by our surroundings, one acquires practices, beliefs, and habits by which one in turn shapes history. This all becomes the Geist, which you, know, you choose to believe in or not. Um, but anyway, these two theories taken together, of Marx and Hegel, create an impression that people shaped by their surroundings and resources in turn shape history, and they provide a much more satisfactory alternative than the great man theory. And I wish to give, no thank you, I wish to give two examples of this theory in ac of history in action, which also will lead me into my third argument on acts of God. So, Mr. Follett spoke of Waterloo, and I'm going to talk about Peterloo, so forgive me. Um, but in 1819, a protest of 60,000 people took place on St. Peter's Field in Manchester, where the crowd was attacked by the yeomanry in what became known as the Peterloo Massacre. Though this crowd was riled up by orators like Henry Hunt, the real concern was the Corn Laws, unemployment, and the failure of the harvest in the previous year. Of course, one might say that the Corn Laws were the fault of Lord Liverpool, William Huskisson, who had introduced them in 1815, but they were also a response to larger trade phenomena. Moreover, nobody could argue that the year without a summer in 1816 was the fault of any great man except that for God. In this instance, then, great men pale in significance to a volcanic eruption and the economy. This piece of history is hardly their biography. Second, I return to my more familiar territory of Salus, refreshingly ancient, Bellum Catilinae, to argue that the revolts across Italy in 63 BC were far more the result of economic and social factors than of any agitation by great men. The Italy of the late Republic is dominated by figures like Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus, but it was also beset by brigandage and piracy, and one only needs to read speeches given by these great men to realize the influence of these factors. 
There was also a shortage of manpower. 23 legions were raised annually, which is about 100,000 men. There was a lack of slaves. There was also a combination of political factors, such a lack of citizenship across Italy and Rulus' abortive agrarian reform, which made people rise up in 63 BC. On top of this, the real kicker was debt, as even the most great man theory author of the time, Sallust, concedes. So in all these factors then, there is no link to any activity by great men in the cause of these uprisings. The people rose up, and the politically disgruntled and ambitious Catiline took advantage of this. In other words, the great man, if Catiline can be considered such, was a product of his circumstances rather than the agent of history. And that's the thing. The great men of the great man theory are propelled forward by their time rather than being authors of history. When Dr. Saki asked what democracy is without the chance of a great man, the key word there isn't great man, it's chance. A Lincoln or a Churchill, the likelihood of them being propelled forwards into their respective positions is mere luck. Yes, they might have a slight spark more than you or I. They might have a slightly sort of better education. <laughs> Perhaps none at all. I'm sorry, but really. Um, I'll continue my speech. Please make a point of information if you wish. Um, continuing on to Einstein, for example, and other great, other great thinkers like this, they existed in complex and unique social situations which owed more to the actions of mi the minute actions even of millions of humans yeah, who came before <laughs> than to supernatural talent they possessed. No, well, I'm not saying that their own actions were luck. I'm saying the cir circumstances to which they were born and the sort of the, the victors, as it were, of a genetic lottery means that they were completely the product of luck when one looks at the wide playing field of history, and conversely, there are many born who have a great genius who cannot express it because they're not born into the correct circumstances with the correct resources at their disposal. Anyway, if um, no one else is going to interject, um, I hope to conclude my speech by saying that I do hope I presented somewhat compelling argument in favour of social history and the collective influence of people, and I've also shown that though great men might crop up once in a while, if only in a generation, there is much luck and situational influence in their success. If we accept this, then one must support the motion. Great men may still exist, but they cannot have that monopoly on history which the opposition wishes them to. With that, members, I urge you to vote for side proposition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the Honourable Secretary.